Hi, Michelle. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit uh, about your, your life journey. How did you go about becoming a roboticist? Gosh, I, when I was thinking about this question, I thought, how far back do I start? <laughs> anyway, <you> <laughs> I decided that there are a couple of things that occurred to me while I was growing up that may influence kind of how I think. So first, I was born into a very large family, um, five of eight uh, kids, and we were all born in the island of Jamaica. Um, my mom's a reg registered nurse, and my dad was a civil servant math teacher. The reason why I say that is because we, just to let you know that I migrated to the United States when I was around 12 in 1980. And I would say two things that occurred that still stay with me. One is the first time experience in a bit of social justice or injustice or discrimination. First as an immigrant coming to the United States and then as a black person because I was, you know, in Jamaica, I wasn't as conscious about race and those types of issues. And so it wasn't until I got to the United States where it was like in your face, kind of like we have very low expectations <laughs> of you and therefore and we don't care how smart you were. And that actually reared up in me this 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 feeling of I needed to prove these people wrong and that um, at the time it was about being Jamaican then it was about being black and then it was about being a woman <laughs> so all these things influence but it, fast forward to you know deciding to become an engineer ended up at University of Pennsylvania mechanical engineering being able to successfully complete the degree and was not thinking about roboticists being a professor, none of that crossed my mind, to be honest. I grew up in a very modest family where we didn't have a lot of money. And so issues of how do I take care of myself beyond college were more predominant. <laughs> and, and the reason why I'm telling this is because a lot of people assume straight lines. And I wanted to just very clearly say that my line to get to here was quite jagged. Um, so after, you know, going and working for a few, I ended up in California working with Westinghouse as a process engineer. And around the time I kind of got, was getting very bored and like, you know, is this it? Kind of questioning myself and what I wanted to do. And a colleague, um, actually one of my long-term mentors, uh, Cora Ingram, who since retired from Penn, told me about, she's like, hey, you should check out Dr. Long, Greg Long. He's at UC Irvine. He's an assistant professor there. He does robotics. And I'm like, ah, I remember Greg when I was an undergraduate at, at, at um, Penn. And so those types of thinking, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to talk to him about this robotic stuff because I was aware of it, but not really aware of it. So after talking to Greg and talking a little bit more about robotics, I was like, oh, this sounds actually really interesting. So I was, I applied to MS PhD program at UC Irvine, and I was going to do this robotic stuff. Um, so <laughs> just a long story short, so then uh, Greg was doing kind of force control, some, some space robotic stuff. And I was like, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, long, then while I was there, Greg connected me to, I actually, it wasn't Greg, but one of his students were doing uh, specifically robotics applied to people with disability. And my grandmother had just gotten a stroke. And so the two together made me go, hmm, I can now see myself being a roboticist, but if I can take this and apply it to rehabilitation issues to people with disability. And then I switched to Stanford and appropriately now I could then call myself a roboticist. <laughs> And then I was going to do this type of work and, and work out, work through robotics as it applied to people with disabilities. So that's kind of how I ended up here. <laughs> well, you clearly proved them wrong. What, what are some of your most, you know, your proudest robotics moments? What are the things you tell people? Ooh, um, I would say, you know, for me, it, it, it was a journey of belief because, um, if you'd asked me 
and my mom or my family, you know, does this little immigrant girl, could she end up here? Um, most people would have probably said no. So for me, the, one of the proudest moments was, you know, completing Stanford with my PhD and having my mom there going, whoa, what is it? I just still don't understand what robotics is, but I'm proud of you anyway. <laughs> Another, you know, and then uh, even kind of the device that we developed, the, the driver's seat, that was cool to see it working, to, to be able to then leverage the data, to encounter subjects, real subjects, and, and get that feeling for the first time that I was actually contributing to the, the, the scholarship of this field. That was really cool. I think a second proud moment was when I, I'm going to fast forward, when my mom um, saw me give uh, my first keynote at a huge robotics conference, the i conference in 2017. That was huge because there I talked about the work that we did in Mexico, talked about affordability in robotics, talked about I talked about some of the, the developments that we had and some of the success. And, and for me, the proud of seeing my mom in front and center going, that's my daughter. You know, that is a huge proud moment. I mean, the, the sad part of it is later that year, my mom passed away. So there is a there's a so I remember that moment very saliently because it, it was a tie to a big achievement, but then to a uh, huge sadness in my life. And then I would say another really um, awesome moments. We're, we're just kind of working with, with students and seeing their success with some of the devices that we have in the lab and, and being excited about the data and, the, and that our hypotheses proving to be true and just ideating, you know, like coming up with really novel concepts. These, it's not like one moment. I can name a thousand. <laughs> But, you know, I would say the most recent one is getting tenure at University of Pennsylvania and seeing all that hard work <laughs> and all the hard work of my students and all the hard work of the lab kind of culminate into like, oh, we, we, given the circuitous route that I've taken to this place, this place, to, that's been an accomplishment as well and feeling very proud that someone's recognizing the, the, the numerous work that we've done in this particular area. And you have a picture of your mom there on your desk, right? Yes. And so sure. th this was actually another proud moment. I didn't, I don't know if you can see it really well. So yeah. this is my mom. <laughs> and this is actually, I should have mentioned this moment was the, when my mom came to my lab here at, in the University of Pennsylvania. And I would say that this is the first time she goes, oh, so I get it now. <laughs> There's something to touch in the robot, right? Like, like now I can explain better what you do, you know? And this is definitely, I'm like, oh, mom, walking through the lab and showing it to her was was definitely a proud moment and it was very tangible now she 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 could say exactly what it was that i was working with even after like several 20 you know 20 15 years <laughs> yeah I, I remember my mom also explaining my phd and i never realized how how well she understood it but at some point she was explaining it to someone in my family and it's true just Having, having her understand and understand it and all this work that you put into it, it is really, yes. it's special. Um, so you also mentioned with your grandma really bringing together the, the usefulness of these robotic solutions mm -hmm. and making life better for people who could use right. them. Um, and, and you do a lot of useful robots in your, your, your lab um, that are really pushing the frontiers. Can we quickly watch this video from your lab? Sure, sure. You're broken down and tired of living life on the merry-go-round And you can't find a fighter, but I see it in you, so we gon' walk it out Ooh, mountains, we gon' walk it out and move
It's not a competition. It's okay if you're not fast. And try to use. The silence is a white And it feels like it's getting hard to breathe And I know you feel like dying But I promise we would take the world to its feet Move I won't dance Bring it to its feet That we have each other some of these robots what gets you excited uh, in your lab so i would say all of them i don't have one special system so i'll i'll take categories so we've been really excited about looking at humanoid type robots um so the the baxter system and using baxter as a platform for understanding maybe the future of therapy and how possibly robots can interact with patients of, uh, you know, with motor impairments, upper limb and lower limb. So that's been excited. And also to even to see how these robots could possibly be exercise entities for people who are elder, et cetera. We've also been super, you know, excited about low cost affordable system. You saw the, the, the TheraDrive, the haptic robot, and we've been specifically working with people with HIV and HIV um, and stroke, and essentially the category of people with both motor and cognitive impairment, and using an affordable system to help diagnose and treat. That's exciting for me because that robot we've been deploying or hoping to deploy to Mexico, to Botswana, to, to really push the frontier of robots that can be affordable and help with access issues in low and middle income countries. So super proud about that system. And the, the work that we've been doing to show that that is actually quite feasible. And then I think another really cool, um, very more recent work is the work that we've been doing with infants and kind of been developing mechatronic smart toys and you and a whole gym type system and trying to figure out how we can understand and and do better job of diagnosing really early infants that are at risk for development to delays that's been fun i've never thought i would really i don't have kids myself so i've been working with these infants have been like super high eye opening <laughs> and that's been really exciting and then i would say the, the fourth category is thinking through this whole idea of tele-rehab and, and working with developing a mobile robot and a therapy system that would support remote rehabilitation and really thinking through the affordability issue there as well, kind of uh, uh, permitting, you know, diagnostic from afar and remote diagnostic and capitalizing on machine learning type techniques to support, you know, real time, you know, well, assessment of both infants and kids and adults. So, 
you know, I can keep going, but I'm going to stop there. <laughs> those, kiddos, those kiddos looked really happy in that video. Actually, I don't know if it's wrong that I would actually love for my kid to be a guinea pig for your experiment <laughs> to try some of these, these, these clever toys. Really interesting. Um, I, get, I imagine that there's many times where it doesn't work or just through this, this zigzag trajectory where things have been really challenging. Do you want to yeah. comment on when things get hard? Wow. I don't think um, they ever not get, you don't ever stop experiencing failure. You know, I think that's, I've had to really thicken my skin and realize that failure is a part of success. It's the, it's, you might fail 10 times and have brilliant success twice, <laughs> two times out of those 10. So getting used to trying and keeping on trying, I think is, is a major philosophy of mine. I would say, you know, for me, big examples are when um, systems crash and that in the, you know, electronic systems, you know, burn or break <laughs> or fall apart. Or in one instance, there was a, we had built the, the toy and it was probably our first iteration. And we put the baby in um, with the toy and we were amazed how strong these babies were. And they were ended up beating up the toy and we were like, whoa. <laughs> I can imagine that. Uh, oh, yeah. flying everywhere. <laughs> and the toy basically disintegrated before our eyes. And we were like, oops. <laughs> I had a I toy in my world. And I thought the kids would look at them, but the first time. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Exactly. <laughs> like, what happened here? And so it was kind of like, oh, that experiment didn't go too well. So now we data need points. To, <laughs> need to know that. <laughs> go back and build more robustly. Or mm -hmm. another time where with the third drive robot, you know, the biggest fear is that any of your robot systems would harm someone. And, you know, you put all kinds of safety um, guards in place, mechanical, electrical, software guards. But the worst thing is when they fail and you have a subject there and you're like, oh, no. And so one time the third drive went out of control. And so it was just back and forth, back and forth. And the, and the subject was like, whoa. <laughs> kind of recognizing and being able to work through those issues um when we fail in private with just our team it's different from when we fail publicly <laughs> but i think the lessons to learn is and i keep reminding my students that it's natural failure occurs we try to minimize it we try to do our hard homework so that we don't have a frequent occurrences of them, but that when they happen, we learn from them, we figure out what we did wrong, and we, we, we get started again. I think that's the biggest um, thing where I would say, you know, a big, a big issue. Another thing that I want to point out in the whole road of being a professor is the, is the, the frequent failure of your ideas to be received with the same excitement you have <laughs> when you write a grant yeah, and why the don't grant... they just give you the money because it's such a great idea <laughs> like, I know. god what are you talking about you don't understand and that failure i would say is something that i struggle with still is when my ideas don't come across of course, they just to learn how do I say them more clearly? How do I, you know, communicate? But I would say the nature of having to seek grant funding is tough, you know, and this may not be the same with all roboticists, but especially if you're a roboticist in an academic space and you're at a university, this is a, a, a constant part of what you have to do to sell your idea and to convince someone to invest in it. I would say you know, the frequency is like what for every 10 grants you write, maybe you get one foot. <laughs> I would say it took me a little while to, to get kind of used to those dynamics. Uh, I'm still getting used to those dynamics because I feel you wedded to your idea. You feel like anyone hearing my idea should want to fund me. <laughs> so that's something else that occurs. Yeah. We both woke up early today. I woke up early to submit a grant, one of those grants that, that <laughs> got rejected. And you woke up early for this interview. What does your usual day look like? Pre-COVID or now? Or... As you wish. <laughs> Pre-COVID and now, that's fine. 
I would say, well, well, let's do now because this might be the new norm, right? So the new norm is trying to work within the, the whole infectious disease paradigms. I would say um, that my day depends on kind of what I'm prioritizing. Usually I'm trying to to deal with f five or so different types of categories of work, teaching, you know, research. And research for me is not just is, is – you know, maybe writing the paper, doing the, the talking to my students about their progress, working through some of their issues, um, service, you know, being able to, to support other activities and scholarship items that I'm doing. And I would say, you know, taking care of self. That's <laughs> so if, if I, I know I'm missing some things, but when I think about those things, I would say my day, I hope what I hope to do every day doesn't always occur. But what I hope to do is that I would wake up, I would put myself in terms of my self care, um, you know, feed my dog, <laughs> go for a walk, <laughs> you know, exercise, do those things that help me mentally stay um, together and, and practice these work life balances. And, um, and things like pray, talk to my family, but then do one of the or two of the priority areas. So like yesterday, it was a huge um, kind of mentoring day. I sat on a dissertation committee. I spent the day or the couple of days before reading the dissertation. Um, I had to work through some publications that we want to put through. So reading that and, and providing those edits. And then a couple of kind of meetings with colleagues, both far and wide, in America, in, in Botswana, etc. So managing and juggling those types of things, I think, is typical. And I would feel like, um, so Fridays is a big teaching day for me. I spend the entire day preparing to teach and teaching. <laughs> And answer questions about you know what I'm teaching. So it really depends. It depends on the day. Um, but I think what's key about each day is is trying to make sure that figure out how to balance. You know, being a woman, being you know, um, being a roboticist, being uh, a friend, being a mentor, being a teacher. You know, you name it. Being a sister. <laughs> all those things that we need to do. So many, so many hats and roles that we have. Yeah. I know you like traveling and COVID is obviously a bit of a, a barrier to that. Tell us a little bit about, about your travels and your work uh, in robotics in other countries. Yeah, so one of my passion areas is to thinking through, you know, social justice issues when it comes to roboticists, uh, robotics and kind of thinking about how do we make robots affordable um, despite where you live. So, and you know, and actually that came out of my thinking about my grandmother and her stroke and the fact that if she had been in Jamaica, then she would have had different access than she had here. So that actually is a part of kind of this movement of that I have, which is thinking about affordable robots for low and middle income countries. As a result, that's led me to do some traveling in Mexico a lot. Um, that's kind of where we began some of our um, prototyping work. We've been working in Costa Rica, in Jamaica, in Botswana, with colleagues in Italy as well, who it's a nine income country, but I've formed collaborations with colleagues there who are also passionate about the idea and then trying to form, you know, relationships with a variety of people so that we kind of sell this story to everyone, you know. <laughs> so a part of that I, for me requires um, the importance of experiencing, you know, what is legitimately there in these countries. I think you could read about them, but I really feel like a part of ed educating ourselves about what's happening on the ground requires traveling and requires seeing it through your eyes and talking to patients and, and clinicians in those particular areas. So that's a passion space for mine. Uh, just applied for a U.S. Fulbright scholarship to be able to 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 get some time to spend um, on the ground in Botswana. 
and bring our TheraDrive robotic system there and the, the, the Rehab Cares gym there. And that's exciting for me because um, I always see the Fulbright as an opportunity to help build capacity, but, you know, in, um, in a new, in this type of country, the middle income country like Botswana, but also to, as a hardcore area to experience and to prove your concept about affordable robot systems and healthcare access. So traveling is my passion. It's on hold. I've been traveling virtually. <laughs> you know, but <laughs> virtually, but I look forward to the day that I can again um, go directly to countries and uh, work closely with colleagues there. With the US Fulbright, I'm hoping that maybe in the spring, um, you know, hoping that COVID kind of um, the situation permits us to travel again, at least to Botswana, to be able to do stuff on the ground there. But yeah, I miss it. I, 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 I I'm, that's I think the one biggest issue that I've had with uh, with COVID. But we make the best of it for now, anyway. <laughs> Any place that you love to go? Oh gosh. Um, well. You know, I spent two years in Italy doing my postdoc, and that was super important for me. One was, I think that was where I got that, uh, another place where I got that global bug, you know, and I was super proud of getting to Italy, learning the language, uh, meeting colleagues there, seeing the biorobotics group there, and really getting to understand a different side of robotics as a result of that experience. So I would say that Italy is one of my favorite places to travel. It's kind of has a, a, a an important place in my heart. Um, the the so I would say that's the number one. I haven't explored the continent of Africa as much as I'd like to. I've been to Botswana and very few places so what i hope to do is maybe in looking towards the future is that i get to visit a lot more countries there while i was in italy i saw a lot of europe i have a dream <laughs> and i would say it's a silly dream but it is a dream to see if i could visit every single country in the world um and make a difference there in some way or just to see it However, the problem is they keep making countries and then the, some of them keep disappearing. <laughs> so I think this might be, a dream that, <laughs> it might be a dream that never occurs. However, I'm going to keep trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's good enough if you visit them all and then some of the borders change. That's okay, I think you have, have done a thorough job anyhow. Um, what would you tell your younger self about a career in robotics? What advice would you have liked to have? Gosh, um, it's a good question. I three things come to mind to be to to explore your options a bit more. Um, what is available? What can be done? Um, I would say to be bolder about your abilities, or maybe more confident. A lot of times kind of growing up as a, a woman where you don't see a lot of, you know, female role models in the area or a black woman where you don't see a lot of, you know, black role models in the area um, is, and even in engineering in general, mechanical engineering didn't see much. You develop a lot of like, there are people naysaying, you know, and so it damages your self-esteem if you allow people's doubts and and their biases against you to to take a seat in your head and your heart you know and I think as a as a young woman I did some of that it sometimes drove me to prove more but it also sometimes damaged a bit of my self-esteem and caused a lot more doubt you ever heard of the imposter syndrome you know it's like do I really belong here <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and do I have a seat at the table? And, and why, why has no one else sat at the table? Is it because, you know, like all these racism, sexism, all those things, you know, kind of um, affect you. And so I think my younger self, I would definitely be encouraging to be stronger, to look for, you know, confirmation within than without. And I would really remind my younger self to tell 
to what my mom always told me, but I sometimes never listened, which is that you could be anything you want to be. And, and my mom was a very strong Christian and she would say, you know, with God, you can do all things, Michelle. <laughs> and, and to listen to that. And my mom had every faith that I would be where I was, but I question sometimes my own faith because I was listening to all these other, you know, doubters and naysayers. And so my younger self, I would definitely encourage to be bold, to strike out, to stay confident, to turn off the, the naysayers and to really look to your community, you know, for the, the confidence you need to keep going. Um, so yeah, you know, my younger self would probably already be, you know, more. However, <laughs> if she listens. <laughs> That's a hugely Im important message. And it's actually a message, I think, for all, all the students across the board who are starting now their PhDs. I find this, this, this self-doubt is holding, holding them back. So yeah. You're right, it is also what drives us, at least for me, this, this idea that I wasn't good enough. You just keep yeah and pushing and pushing and that does sometimes also contribute to the success but with with a bit more misery somehow yes <laughs> <laughs> with a bit miserable. more misery yeah. so if we could get that confidence without the you know and yeah. and, and the drive without the you know the isms the in our ears <laughs> what yeah. um, what is your next frontier in robotics who um so when I go to sleep in robotics, <laughs> if robotics is on my mind, I am envisioning this um, using the technology to be an enabling technology for healthcare access and rehab access in developing spaces as well as developed spaces, which I think it's it's proven more in, in developed spaces, but I just see such a huge void, you know, um, across the world. And, and, and so for me, it's figuring out how to enable robotics to really make a difference in low and middle income countries and to remove this price point issue, to remove the, the things that make it difficult to use them in you know, in uh, like a place like Botswana or, or, you know, another kind of like developing space like Jamaica. For me, the frontier is in that space. How do we, and what are the enabling things that we need to do to make, to truly make robots affordable? And, and what, how can we drive that even more? Um, for me, the frontier is, is, is that, is, is the vision is robots not everywhere in private locations where people have money, but robots like in everywhere, regardless of whether people have money. <laughs> and that, um, and I also, I, I see myself as, and it's funny, like most people might talk about the technology or talk about, you know, developing the next energy system or whatever. But I would say maybe it's because because of the way that way I was raised, or maybe because of the way my orientation is. I always see robotics as enabling for helping people get better, and for me, the next frontier is robots that are truly able to take their place in healthcare spaces to make people better. We talk about it, but we're quite we're not quite there yet. You know, what are the key things that need to happen? I want to be a part of making that occur um, so that we don't just talk about it, but that we're seeing it, you know? Um, so those, that's my passion point. And then also to broaden the, broaden the, the ability of rehabilitation uh, robots and uh, uh, rehabilitation assistive therapeutic robots to really and truly meet the need of the average patient. Um, we've been doing some work in kind of pushing the motor and the cog and, cause most of the time we're very, you know, researchers and sometimes we have to be because of just like, you can't 
answer everything, but we're focused, you know, like we're only going to say, if you have a motor impairment, we're going to include you and we're going to exact study this. But sitting in the clinical side, oftentimes the average patient is so complex and they're, they have such comorbidities like mo motor and cog and, and these things throw off our ideal scenario. And I want, I, I think one of my biggest things is figuring out how that robotics could meet the complexity of these patients. And we've started by kind of looking at motor plus cog together, you know, <laughs> and what's the next level that we can begin to expand the, and understand the, the complex patient and be able to meet that need. Uh, I don't know if I, that that's clear, but those are some of the two things that are kind of in my in my kind of uh, thinking and like where we need to go next. <laughs> well, robots that make a difference, real robots in real world scenarios. I think we'll end on that on that positive note. That's that's what needs to happen in robotics. I, I agree. <laughs> so thank you so much. That was so inspiring. It was really wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity to just chill and talk to you and share a little bit about my journey hopefully it's inspiring to someone who sees the your um the video it's inspiring to me so i'm sure it'll be inspiring to everyone